Hello, hello, and welcome back to my channel. We've got a bit of a different video this week. I'm not weekly vlogging because I've got such a hectic few days coming up. Sorry about that bird. <laughs> Tomorrow I am moving out of this apartment, going to Freya's for four days, and then moving into our new apartment. And I'm doing it all on my own because Sid's on a business trip at the moment. But I thought it gave us a nice opportunity to have a bit more of a catch up and for me to answer some of your questions about my time in Sydney and the move over here, especially now that I've got a job and I'm moving into a new apartment soon. Okay, so let's start with why did you move to Sydney? So as you may or may not know, my boyfriend Sid and I have been traveling around, living in a few different places since we graduated uni last year and Australia was always on that list of places that we wanted to go to. And we decided to make the move in January because that is summer in Australia. So it made sense to come when the weather was the nicest. The reason it was Sydney in particular, as opposed to any other cities in Australia, is mostly because of Sid's job. So he is co-director of a UK-based travel agency called My Adventure Project, and they organize group tours up the east coast of Australia. And those group tours either start in Sydney or Sydney is the second stop on the trip. So it made sense for them to have someone over here working remotely on the same time zone as those customers. How long do you think you'll stay for? So when we moved, we initially had in mind three months just to see whether or not we liked Sydney and wanted to stay longer or if we wanted to go anywhere else in Australia, or if we didn't want to be in Australia at all. But genuinely within four days of arriving in Sydney, I knew that this was somewhere that I wanted to stay far longer than three months. It's funny because when I came to Sydney, when I was doing the East Coast two years ago, I didn't really think much of it, to be honest. I thought I preferred Melbourne, but I think that's because when you come as purely just a tourist, I guess, for a short period of time. And all you see is kind of the Opera House and Harbour Bridge and the really touristy sites. It's a very different city than when you come here for longer and you have the opportunity to see the different suburbs and beaches other than Bondi. And I think seeing that different side to the city and viewing it through a slightly different lens than just a tourist was what made me really fall in love with the place. So to answer the question, I don't know how long will stay for, but it's definitely gonna be for the foreseeable future because I just love life here and I'm really enjoying it. So I have no intention of leaving anytime soon. Okay, getting into the nitty gritty, more boring details. What visa are you on? What's the application process like? So I am on my first working holiday visa and the application process for it was super simple. It was just a form that you had to do on the IMI website. And once I'd submitted my application, my visa was genuinely granted within less than a minute. I nearly missed the email because it came through that quick. I just assumed that it was confirmation or something that I'd submitted my application, but it was the actual visa. It's worth bearing in mind that it does cost $635 to apply for a working holiday visa and that's equivalent to £327 when I did the exchange rate this morning. And also in your application you need to prove that you have sufficient funds for your trip and you need to prove that you have $5,000, which is equivalent to £2,581 as of this morning. So that's the only thing I would bear in mind for the visa application. The rest of it was pretty self-explanatory, I think. I am not a visa expert though, so if you have any specific 
questions, I would really recommend going and reading all of the information on the IMI website. There is quite a lot of information on there and I'd say it's relatively easy to understand. Following on from that, I got a few questions asking if I still need to do my farm work and what my plan is for this. And the answer to that is no. As of it's either June or July 2024. As a UK passport holder, I no longer need to do any farm work and I can stay for three years on working holiday visas. Is Sydney expensive? What's the cost of living like? I would say it is a fairly expensive city, but not as expensive as London, for example. Like it feels doable here. For example, supermarkets are notoriously expensive here, but I don't think they're massively different in terms of prices to how prices have increased in the UK in the last few years. I'd say my food shops are pretty similar price-wise. To give you an idea of rental prices, for the new apartment that Sid and I are about to move into, we pay £220 each a week, and that is for a one-bed, pretty spacious apartment in a very good location, lots of windows, lots of natural light, also an incredible view, and most of the bills included in that price. I know if that flat was in the location that it's in and had that view in London, we would be paying so much more than that. It definitely is possible to have cheaper rent as well if you're just subletting or you're in a smaller apartment in a location that's maybe a bit further out. Following on from that, how was it finding an apartment? So the apartment that we're in at the moment and I'm going to be moving out of tomorrow is actually an Airbnb. So we booked this place months before we came to Australia and I would really recommend booking an Airbnb or booking yourself into a hostel for the first few weeks or the first few months that you arrive in Sydney. And the reason I say this is because I would not recommend signing a longer term lease for a place that you haven't seen because if there is one thing that I've learned from the apartment hunting process here, it is that the photos are so deceptive. The photos on real estate websites can make any apartment look like the most amazing light-filled space, super spacious, but it's because they edit them so much and often they'll take it on a 0.5 lens, so it gives that fisheye effect to a room. There have been so many viewings that I've gone to thinking it's a spacious, light-filled apartment to get there and realise that it's a dingy basement flat that looks nothing like the photos. So my advice would be to book yourself in somewhere like an Airbnb or a hostel, something that can be easily cancelled or changed just for the first period of time here whilst you're apartment hunting. So yeah, we've been here for three months in this apartment and I'd say about a month ago is when I started looking for longer term leases. Sid and I were looking for a one bed apartment. So this is the process for that. But if you're moving on your own, I'd recommend looking at sublets because they'll be much more affordable. The only way Sid and I can afford a one bed apartment for just us is because we're paying half half on the rent. So if you're coming on your own and you're looking for a sublet, all of my friends that have done that have found their sublets through Facebook groups. There's different Facebook groups for different suburbs. There's backpacker Facebook groups. So have a look because that seems to be one of the main ways that sublets are circulated. However, if you're in a situation similar to Sid and I and you do want to find a one bed apartment, a two bed apartment, whatever, then the main websites that I used were real estate and domain, although I found that the same properties were often on both of them. So by the end of my search, I was just using real estate and particularly the real estate app because on the app, you can save all of your paperwork in one place. So then when you're doing applications, everything is just ready to go and you can kind of send out batch applications without having to re-upload 
all of the paperwork. Because this is one thing to bear in mind, you require so much paperwork when doing apartment applications here. And as someone that is not an Australian resident, had a job in Australia by that point, but hadn't actually started yet, we were really struggling to meet the quota for all the paperwork that you required. So we did get rejected from quite a few apartment applications that we did. Actually, before we get into that, I'm skipping ahead a bit here. The process of finding an apartment is you often book to view the property and you book this on real estate or domain or whatever site the estate agent is using. You then go to the viewing and they have a register of people and then at the viewing, you will often be given the link to apply. You can pre-apply, which is actually what we did for the apartment that we're about to move into, but I'd only recommend doing that if the estate agent tells you to, because I've heard mixed things about pre-applying. So to give you an idea of the time frame of this application process, it moves very quickly. So for the apartment that we're about to move into, I saw that on the real estate app, I think 15 hours after it had been uploaded. I put an inquiry in for a viewing because there wasn't time stated yet. The estate agent got back to me pretty quickly and said, do you want to view it tomorrow morning? I said, yes, we arranged a time. And she also said, if you really like the property, I would recommend pre-applying. So that evening, the same evening that I'd inquired about the property, we put our application in. The next morning we went to view the property and the estate agent said that the landlord had looked at our application, was happy with everything. So now it was just a case of whether or not we liked the apartment and we did like it. So we confirmed that. And then that same afternoon, she sent over the information about the holding deposit and the bond, which is something I'll get into in a second. So I'd say all in all, the entire process literally happened within 24 to 48 hours. It was a very, very quick turnaround. And that was three weeks before we were even due to move in. So going back to the paperwork, the reason that I think our application for this apartment was approved was because this time we decided to offer rent up front, which was something that we'd been recommended to do by another estate agent for another property. Because we're lacking a lot of the paperwork that strengthens your application, like a residency and a tenant ledger and all of these different things that I still don't really understand what they are, the estate agent said, you kind of need another bargaining chip. And she said, if you have the funds, I would recommend offering two or three months upfront rent. And luckily Sid and I did have the savings available to be able to do that. And as soon as we did offer three months rent upfront, we got two offers for apartments that we were then able to choose from. And they were both incredible apartments. Of course, that isn't necessary. You definitely don't need to offer upfront rent and it's not an expected thing but I just thought I'd share because I think that's definitely the reason that we ended up getting two offers after so many rejections. Even if you're not paying that amount of upfront rent, it is still worth bearing in mind that there are still quite a few initial costs involved in getting an apartment here. So firstly, we had to pay a holding deposit, which was equivalent to one week's rent. And as soon as you send over this holding deposit, they will take down the apartment ad from whatever website it was advertised on and cancel any further viewings. You then also have to pay a bond, which I think is often equivalent to four weeks rent. That was what it was for us anyway. And a bond is basically their equivalent of what we'd call a deposit in the UK, I think. And sometimes on top of that, they'll also want you to pay a month's worth of rent or maybe a few weeks worth of rent. So I would definitely recommend saving up quite a good amount before you move to Sydney just to cover all of these initial costs because between the visa application, the proof of funds for the visa, the holding deposit, the bond, and maybe some upfront rent, it adds up to quite a few 
thousand pounds. Okay, moving on, how was the process of finding a job? To summarize, it was a long process, but that's also because I was ideally looking for a marketing role and that is a very competitive field wherever you are in the world. It took me about six weeks to secure the job that I now have and the process for that job specifically was an online application, an interview and then a trial shift. The websites I was predominantly using for my job search were Seek, which is an Australian job website marketplace and LinkedIn. Lots of people were actually recommending to use recruiters, especially for jobs in marketing. And a few people I know have had success going through that route. For me, I didn't really get anywhere with them. I found that most of the time they either didn't reply or would put me on their database and then I never heard anything. So even though it probably is still worth reaching out to them, I think the key is being proactive and resilient yourself. If you're looking for a hospitality or a retail role, I think that process is a lot simpler and a lot quicker. So obviously I never went through this specific application process, but for my friends that are working hospitality roles, the way that they got those jobs is they actually went round physically into cafes, into restaurants, into bars with a printed out CV and gave in their CV and application that way. And I think this is a super common way of doing it. In Australia, I've seen so many TikToks of people doing the same thing and I see it all the time in real life as well. A piece of advice from my friend Freya as well. She said that when she was job hunting, she would only ever give her CV into the manager of a cafe, a restaurant, a bar. So she would go in, she would ask if a manager was on shift. If they were, then she would chat directly to them, ask for a job, introduce herself, give her CV over. And if they weren't on shift, she would ask when they were and then she would just come back another time. And she's got like four jobs now. So <laughs> I think she knows what she's talking about. But regardless of what job you're looking for, my biggest piece of advice is just to stay resilient. It can be the most humbling, disheartening experience, but I know everyone always says it, it will work out in the end. You've just got to keep going. Next question is, is it difficult to make friends in Sydney? Of all the places that I've moved to and lived, I personally think Sydney is one of the easiest places to make friends because there's just so many people that are in a similar situation to you. There's so many people from the UK here, for example. My advice for actually meeting people would be to join lots of different Facebook groups. So for example, one of the main ones that I've used is one called Sydney Working Holiday Girls, and they organize all sorts of different events every month that give girls an opportunity to meet one another. I've been on a Hunter Valley wine trip with them. I went to a paint and sip night. I went to a couple social with Sid and other couples, and I've met some really nice people through that. Obviously it can be really daunting going to these events on your own but unfortunately you've just got to put yourself out there and push yourself out of your comfort zone if you want to meet new people. I don't really think there's an easy way to go about it. One thing I would say though if you're coming solo Staying in a hostel for your first few weeks here whilst you're looking for a sublet or an apartment is also a great way to meet other people because hostels will often have their own social events on. But once again, my advice for making friends is just to persevere. I know it can be awkward and it can be disheartening, but if you just keep going, you will meet your people. Were there any culture shocks slash cultural differences? So I've been to Australia before so there was nothing culturally that really shocked me but a cultural difference that I actually really like here is everything just happens earlier finishes earlier here so for example cafes and coffee shops 
will open at 5, 6 in the morning and be closed by 3 p.m. in the afternoon. You will struggle to get a coffee past 3 p.m. in Australia. Day drinking is also a very big thing here. So if you're going out for drinks, you'll be going out for drinks at 4, 5 p.m. and you'll often be back in bed by nine, which I personally love. I've even gone on a night out here for the first time in, I wanna say over a year, but the reason that I wanted to go is because I knew the club closed at one. So I knew that I'd be back at a fairly reasonable hour, Whereas in Leeds, for example, I feel like you're only getting to the club at one. Obviously there are later night options if you want them, but I just personally love that element of the culture. I'm much more of an early morning person than a late night person. This might also be because it's been summertime and the weather's been so nice, but I've noticed that there's a big emphasis here on being outside and being active and keeping healthy. There are so many run clubs, for example, in this city, so many different sports happening, lots of healthy eating options. And I really like that that is a valued part of the culture here, more so than the UK at least. Okay, final question. How are you finding living far away from family and friends? So I've always been a fairly independent person and I was never homesick at uni, for example. And I still don't feel that homesick now in Australia, but I would say I definitely feel more disconnected being over here because of the time difference. There have been so many times, for example, especially when I was job hunting and everything was up in the air that all I wanted to do was ring my parents to get some advice, but I can't because it's the middle of the night for them. So you've really got to plan when you have these catch-ups with friends and family back home to make sure that the time differences align, which definitely makes it harder to keep in contact. It's also easy to forget, I think, that time moves on still back home, even when you're out here. For example, in December last year, my family got a cat and I met him, he's called Chucky by the way, in December when he was still a kitten. But now he's basically a fully grown cat and I've missed out on all of those months of him being a kitten and a young cat. And obviously that's, you know, not the end of the world and a bit of a silly example, but it can feel quite sad sometimes feeling like you're missing out on those things. Okay, that was quite a negative note to end this video on. So I just wanna kind of wrap up by saying that I'm absolutely loving my experience here and I don't regret moving here at all. I think in a lot of ways, it has been the perfect place to come to after graduating because the lifestyle here and the attitude is just so laid back compared to the UK and I think removing myself from that narrative of graduating and just moving to London and starting a corporate career has actually allowed me the time and the space to truly think about what I want to do. And in the process, it's also made me much more of a laid back person, I think. Like even my friend Freya said this the other day and she lived with me at uni, so she knew what I was like at uni. And she said, you're just so much more relaxed in Australia. And I don't think I realized either how tightly wound and stressed I was at uni until I came to Sydney and I just breathed a bit, I think. And so many of you guys have noticed it as well that I just seem happier and more light and uplifted here because I am. <laughs> so yeah, that is everything for this video. I hope that's answered some of your questions that you might have had. The weekly vlogs will resume next week and I'll be in the new apartment, which is very exciting. So make sure to subscribe for all of the upcoming vlogs. Follow me on my Instagram and my TikTok and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.